on today's episode of the Cryptoverse. The moment we've all been waiting for, the brand new all-in-one revamped software for the Ledger hardware wallet has been launched and today I will give you a quick walkthrough. And today's technical analysis will focus on Bitcoin plus a segment on Komodo by request from this viewer who sent me an EOS tip with a request in the memo field. So all of that on today's episode of the Cryptoverse, so stay right there. Hi there guys, welcome to the latest episode of the Cryptoverse, your regular dose of news and commentary on Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies and blockchains and I'm your host Chris Coney. So let's get into the first story which is Ledger Live. So up until now we've all been managing our Ledger hardware wallets using those Google Chrome extensions and bit fiddly, not ideal. Ledger Nano S as a hardware device, pretty much the best one, however it was just lacking in the software department until now. And then a few, I don't know, months ago on the Cryptoverse, I said this was coming and now it is here. I've downloaded it, I've tested it, I've played with it, and I've recorded some interactions of my first play with it so I can sort of narrate how it went. So you can download it now for Windows, Mac OS, Linux, and you can also get the source code on Ledger's website. So now let's hop over to the app itself and I'll give you the walkthrough. So the first thing you see when you load up the app is the new Ledger onboarding process, which asks you what kind of wallet you want to start with. I clicked on use device that's already initialized and you select the type of device. I have a Ledger Nano S. Now it says, did you choose the pin for yourself? And of course, yes, I did on my existing Ledger. Uh, did you save your own recovery phrase for yourself? Yes, I did. And is your Ledger genuine? Well, you click check now, plug the device in and unlock it and it will actually check if your Ledger Nano S is genuine or not. This is one of the concerns people have when they buy one, is there's that story from eBay about someone buying a second-hand Ledger and then it taking all of their money because it was a compromised device from a hacker, it was already initialized and they already had the private key for that device. So then this third step, once it has been opened and you're on the dashboard on the device, it will just take a few seconds and verify if your Ledger is genuine. And in my case, it says your device is genuine. So I click continue. Then it says, do you want to set a password to lock the actual software? Because with this software, you can open it up without the device plugged in. So do you want people to see your balances and whatnot? In my case, no. So I'll just enter a password that I can remember, confirm it by entering it a second time, and then go ahead, click continue. You can skip this step if you want to, but I didn't think that was a good idea. Then you have the whole privacy thing. Do you want to share anonymous bug reports with Ledger and all the rest of it? I don't particularly mind that. The only one I left turned off was to share analytics. Um, that one I didn't particularly like the idea of, so I just left that one off. And that's it. That's the whole onboarding process and done. The Ledger device is now ready to use. So I click open Ledger Live and I get a little warning to say that, you know, educate yourself about crypto assets because um, if you lose them, you lose them. And in the background, you'll notice that there is no accounts inside the Ledger Live app by default. So we have to add all that in again. I find it interesting that they now call it your portfolio, which kind of sticks you in the investor mindset, doesn't it? So on the main menu, you've got Open Manager, which is the Ledger Manager to install the various apps. And you've got Add Accounts, which are the accounts that you put your various coins into. So by default, there isn't anything in there. So the first thing I did was select Bitcoin, clicked continue, and then it scans your, uh, your Ledger device for any balances. But of course, you have to have the device unlocked and you have to open the Bitcoin app on the device. Then it will begin the process of scanning. It's now going to pull in all of my existing accounts from my, you know, from my previous Ledger wallet. And like I said a minute ago, unfortunately, it doesn't bring any of the labels with it. And this is something that I've found in previous Ledger wallet updates is that I go through the process of naming each and every one of my accounts so that I know which one's which and what it's for. And then when you upgrade the software, it just renames them to something generic. And then you have to you know, figure out which one's which again. So yeah, we're gonna have to do that again. The five or so wallets that I have in mind here are just generic called Bitcoin one, two, three, and four. It was around about this time that I wondered why I was looking at it in a little window. So I decided to maximize it and then uh, see the whole thing. And by this time, there's all my Bitcoin wallets have been scanned uh, with all the various labels and so on. So then I can just click 
add accounts and that will pop it right inside of the new Ledger Live app. So that's that sorted and now you will see what the new Ledger Live app looks like. It's much more of a portfolio manager style thing with your overall portfolio performance at the top and um, whether it's performance by day, month or year, which you can click in the top right hand corner. One thing that I think is missing from this straight away is a pie chart that tells you how diversified you are in terms of what proportion of your wealth is in Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum and all the rest of it. But it lists all your accounts down the left hand side. You can click the plus button to add some more. You've got all the basic send and receive stuff. You've got the Ledger Manager app if you want to you know, install more apps onto the device itself for various coins. If you want to do that, you have to exit the Bitcoin app that I was just in, and then it will bring up the Ledger Manager app. It's, there's a lot of them, and um, this time they've got a search feature for the catalog, which is nice. But the next thing I did was went ahead and started to add more coins. But again, this is all searchable as well. So the next thing I tried was to add Ethereum. I thought, I wonder how it handles Ethereum coins. But unfortunately, in this case, you know, even though I tried it three times, it just sat here for a long, long time and didn't pull in any of my Ethereum balances. No matter how hard I tried, I connected the device, disconnected it, all the rest of it, it just didn't do it. Maybe it was just a case of me waiting a bit longer for the syncing to, to take place, but I um, I wanted to get on with make the video, so I, I gave up on that at this point. One obvious question when talking about Ethereum is, does it support ERC20 coins? The answer is no, not at the moment. That is upcoming in a future version, so stay tuned for that with another version, a future version of the Ledger Live app. So back to the dashboard then, and you've got like a send and receive feature. These send and receive forms look really similar to like the Coinbase ones with um, the ability to enter, you know, pounds or Bitcoin as the amount, set the fee, you can even set a custom fee. Same with the receive one, you select the account you want to receive into. And just like the previous version of the Ledger apps, you have to A, open the app on the device, of course, like it's warning me to here. And that's because it wants to verify the address on the device to prevent one of those men in the middle attacks where someone displays a their, their address in the software, which isn't an actual address that belongs to you. So that's why it tells you to verify the address on the device itself. So that feature has made it over to the new Ledger Live app. The next thing I wanted to take a look at was the exchanges button. I thought, what on earth is this? I thought, have they got um, Shapeshift built in? The answer is no. The three exchanges they list here, CoinHouse, Changely, and CoinMama, they're just links and you click them and they pop open the web pages for each of these individual exchanges. So no Shapeshift integration in the app as yet. So you can't just spontaneously swap one coin for another like you can say with KeepKey, but I'm sure that they're working on that as we speak. The next thing I noticed, which is probably peculiar to me as a trackball user, but there are no scroll bars. The app assumes that you've got a scroll wheel on your mouse or that you're using a touchpad on a laptop where you can do a two finger swipe. So what I had to do is click on any one of the given panes and use the arrow keys on my keyboard to move up and down. The settings section is pretty much the same as it always was. You can change the currency that is displayed. You can change the uh, the exchange that is actually providing the price feed for Bitcoin. Uh, you can change whether the password lock works. You can change the language of your wallet and all the rest of it. But all in all, a huge improvement over previous generations. And I think we're now getting to the point of user interface quality that it needs to be at for mass market adoption. And I'm so pleased to see Ledger leading the way in this regard. Now onto the technical analysis portion, focusing on Bitcoin firstly. So right now, Bitcoin is at 6,591. And following on from yesterday's analysis, you can see that that key level of 6,800 has been rejected. So that makes it even more important. It was rejected most recently on the 7th of the 7th, and it was nearby about the 4th of the 7th. And as we spoke about yesterday, there were the two key areas where it tried to break above it, either side of the 19th of June, and then either side of the, the 11th of June. So that level remains a very key resistance level that if broken, it should provide some either elasticity, meaning it will peep up above it and then get pulled back under again, or if the confidence is strong enough, it could be an explosive move out from that. Um, the breakout could also be a pullback and a retest 
If this resistance turns into support, that will provide an excellent floor for us to ride up to the next key level, which I read out yesterday, which is 77.60. So today when I say the price has been rejected off of that 6,800, the top of that candle has pretty much bounced right off and it's pulled right back from 6,800 to about 6,600. As I record this, it's sitting right on the 50 EMA on the four hour chart. Yesterday, I was hoping that the 200 EMA was gonna be providing support like it had been doing over the last several candles, but now with some decent sell-off pressure has fallen right back down to the 50 EMA. So based on what's been happening since the beginning of July, we could see this range bound movement between the two levels of 6400 and 6800. So that's a $400 range that we could bounce in between for the time being. Then on to analyzing Komodo, the first thing I did was check out CoinMarketCap to find out the highest liquidity exchange. It turns out to be Binance with Komodo trading against Bitcoin. So I went ahead and then pulled that up on TradingView. So I'm going to take a one day view because again with this coin, like many of the ones that users request, there's not a complete set of data. By the looks of this, Binance only started trading Komodo against Bitcoin on the 7th of November 2017. So that's all the data we've got to go on here. So straight away you can see that Komodo was not immune to the mania back in December of 2017. It hit its all-time high here of about uh, 12,598 Satoshis, which is quite a long way away from where it is today at 2,416 at time of recording. The other most notable thing here is that there's been a very steady and consistent downtrend for Komodo against Bitcoin really since the beginning of May. So I'm not going to draw trend lines on here because I've got more to say about more significant levels. But never mind the frills, the key takeaway from this that I saw was I drew two key support and resistance levels. One is actually based on the last few days of price action. It's at 2,266 Satoshis, which is providing somewhat of support. When I look back to the old data from December, I found the all-time low down here at 1,700 Satoshis, which we are not that far away from. When we see something like Komodo in a consistent downtrend like this, this is where you, know, you start paying attention to it and looking for buying opportunities. Uh, in my view, Komodo has solid technology and solid fundamentals, so this price sell-off doesn't actually put me off. It actually appeals to me because what you want is solid projects that are coming down in price so you can get in on a solid project at a very, very attractive price so that when their fundamentals kick back in and take over the price, in the bull run, they'll have more substance to them and you'll make a nice gain on them. So the two very attractive buying levels, in my view, are around about where it is now, around about the 2,200 Satoshi mark, and uh, keep a bit of cash on the side in case we get down to the all-time low of 1,700 Satoshis for an absolute bargain. As always, please don't take any of this as financial advice. In no way am I recommending you take any action in particular. I'm just giving you this information for educational purposes. And that's all I've got for you today. So if you thought this video was terrible, you can hit that button. But if you liked it, hit the like button, get subscribed, and then find out how you can deepen your cryptocurrency knowledge greatly and how to make and save money with cryptocurrencies using the link in the video description. Also down there is a link to my second channel, which is all about EOS. And if you've got a bit more time, check out this video, which I've released recently. I'll be back with the next episode of the Cryptoverse. So until then, it's me, Chris Coney saying bye for now.